Good morning and welcome to our Sunday morning service for the Lebanon Church of Christ in Dresden, Tennessee. Uh, this pre-recorded service is being made available for Sunday, uh, January 21st, 2024. And we have had a, a big week, uh, snow week, ice week, uh, schools have been out, a lot of businesses have been closed, uh, local government's been shut down for much of the week. And uh, we know that some of you may be joining us today because of that. You may still be dealing with uh, snow or icy conditions uh, where you live, or you may be uh, not in our immediate area, but we know those conditions are, are happening all around the country. But whatever brings you to us today, uh, we're thankful for your presence uh, here with us. I do want to let our local folks know that, uh, Lord willing, this morning, 9 a.m., we will be meeting at the building for our Sunday school classes at 10 a.m. for worship, and then at 5 p.m. for our uh, discussion Bible study. Um, the parking lot is clear. Uh, the road to the church building is cleared off now, uh, and the building is warm. Uh, so, Lord willing, uh, that's our plan uh, to meet in person today. So, if you're watching this locally, maybe you turn this on early this morning, uh, and you're seeing it, and you're thinking, well, we're not going to be able to go to the building today because of of weather, uh, and you realize, okay, we are meeting in person, and you want to do that, uh, please go ahead and, and join us if you can. Uh, if not, uh, if, if sickness or the weather uh, or maybe distance, tra uh, some of our members travel from a great distance to be with us each Sunday, um, that's fine. Uh, we're here for that reason, uh, and that's why we share this video each week. Uh, we want people to use uh, their best judgment, and obviously we would love to see you in person, uh, but if we need to uh, hang out here today uh, and have our online time, uh, that is that is great too. I'm glad, again, that you are here with us. Uh, we've been engaged in a series uh, about commitment, kingdom commitments, and we've talked about God's commitment to us, our commitment uh, to Him, and today we want to talk about uh, our commitment to our church family. And uh, I think it's appropriate that we do that. It's always good to be reminded uh, of the church and the importance of the church. And I think especially in a week maybe where we haven't had uh, as many opportunities to be out and to be engaged with others, uh, it's even uh, perhaps more fitting uh, that we share uh, share some thoughts about the, the reasons for the church, um, the reasons that we need the church, and we need to make a personal commitment uh, to being a part of, uh, of a local church family. Uh, with that being said, um, our online format will follow much uh, what we do each week, much much the same pattern. Uh, I'll begin here in just a moment with a word of prayer, and then I will share that lesson uh, about commitment uh, to our church family. Uh, following that, I'll uh, be able to offer a couple of prayers. If you're there with your uh, physical family at home, um, snowed in today or dealing with sickness or travel, uh, a couple of prayers that you can use uh, if you're taking communion together. Uh, following that, we'll have some announcements uh, that will be of particular interest to our local folks uh, about the sick and uh, those who are celebrating different milestones this week. Uh, following that, we'll then close uh, with a word of prayer. Uh, if this is your first time to join us, or maybe you just stumbled across this video, or you've seen where uh, someone has shared it on Facebook, and you want to get updates uh, about what we're doing at Lebanon, uh, if you want to be able to uh, tune in directly uh, to our services each week, you can follow uh, our Facebook page, and uh, you can also follow uh, this channel uh, where you're watching on YouTube. Uh, and then each week, without any um, other prompting or anything like that, uh, you'll be able to access these videos and have that in one uh, convenient place. We'll have to search for it uh, each week if you'll be joining us uh, in that way. Let's go ahead then uh, and uh, begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll step into our uh, lesson time together. Let's pray this morning. Our Father, we're grateful uh, for this day. We're grateful for the safety that we have and the uh, the ability that we have to come together in this format. Uh, we're grateful for all those who have worked so diligently to get our roads back open and to keep our power on and to keep our homes uh, warm and our stores stocked. And uh, Lord, we know that uh, although we don't experience this weather often, when we do, it's a, it's a burden for many people uh, and makes it difficult for folks to get out, for folks to interact with others. And uh, if that's uh, something that we need today, we ask that this time together would uplift us and strengthen us, that we would be able to engage not just with your word, but with your people. Uh, Lord, as the uh, weather uh, seems to be improving uh, for the week ahead and folks will be able to be back out, uh, please help us to look for ways to encourage those who are hurting, uh, those who are struggling, those of our own uh, family and congregation, but also those of the community around about us, and help us to look for people who may have been overlooked 
uh, and to reach out to them with your love and with your compassion uh, this week. Uh, we pray for those who are uh, sick, those who are awaiting surgeries, those who are going through uh, treatments at this time. We have several folks who are in the midst of treatments for cancer or are looking forward to uh, surgeries that are coming up in the next few weeks. Um, and we just ask that your uh, hand of protection and care would be on them and on the doctors and nurses who are uh, tending to them, on their families who are supporting them, and that they might uh, recover uh, as much as possible uh, in accordance with your will. We're grateful, Lord, for the community in which we live and for uh, the close-knit uh, place that we have to call home. And we ask that you would watch over our local leaders, our state leaders, our federal le leaders, uh, especially in this uh, time of uh, elections coming up throughout our country. And we just ask, Lord, that people would use good judgment and that those who lead would seek to do so in a way that uh, helps uh, our people and brings our country together and uh, also allows us the opportunity to continue to, to spread your word and to be active and effective uh, wherever we find ourselves in ministry. We pray, Lord, for our missionaries, for those who are overseas that we are supporting and those who are in places in our own country where the church is not strong. We pray for those who are training for ministry. Uh, we pray for the upcoming lectureship at Freed Hardman, and we pray for those who are uh, will be planning to attend that. And we pray for all those uh, people who are uh, giving their lives and giving years of their lives and uh, sacrificing so that they can minister uh, to your people throughout the world. And we give thanks for them uh, today, and we lift them up. Uh, we ask that you would be with those who teach today, uh, that the things that are said might not only be true, but might be encouraging uh, and lift up our hearts uh, as we worship today. We ask, Lord, that you would be with those who serve our country, whether that's in the military or uh, in diplomatic positions or uh, in peacekeeping operations throughout the world. We ask that you would be with them and bless them. We ask, Lord, that you would bless those places that are in conflict uh, right now um, where there's violence in the world. And we ask that your hand of healing and your hand of grace would be on those folks. And also that we would make decisions uh, in our daily lives insofar as we can uh, that would uh, help uh, for conflicts to cease and that the gospel might have free reign throughout the world. We're grateful, Lord, for uh, our church family and especially today as we talk about the need for commitment uh, to our church family and to the church in general, uh, that you would strengthen us to be more committed not just in our uh, physical attendance, but in our giving, uh, in our prayer life, in our uh, efforts to represent you before the world each day. We ask that you would strengthen us in that. Help us in all ways to be conformed to Christ, uh, who loved us and sacrificed for us and who brings us to you uh, on his merit and on his strength. And Lord, we recognize our own weakness and our own sinfulness and how we could not approach you uh, without your grace and without your love extended in Christ. Help us to keep that at the forefront of our mind as we seek to uh, encourage others and welcome them uh, in your name. Bless us throughout this week ahead, especially as we're uh, catching up, many of us, from things missed last week during the bad weather. Uh, watch over us and, and keep us safe and in your care. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, again, it's good to, uh, good to see you and to have the opportunity uh, to be here with you, uh, be here with you this morning. I mentioned that we've been talking about uh, in our series, and these uh, these videos, uh, these recordings are available. Uh, there'll be the two directly before uh, before this on our Lebanon page. Uh, if you look there, you'll see them uh, on our on our YouTube uh, where this has been shared. Uh, we've been talking about kingdom commitments, and one of the things that our culture is um, has changed rapidly about in in recent years is the idea of commitment. Uh, we've always lived in a pretty, um, uh, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, self-focused, uh, hardworking kind of culture. Uh, and there's good and bad, of course, to that. Um, the culture of scripture was similar, except there was a lot more sense of dependence, I think, and community, similar to maybe what we experienced in our own country uh, up until we became more mobile uh, and we became more, um, honestly, connected with technology. And uh, we see that, of course, not only in business, we see that not only in school, uh, we see that in the family. Uh, and our families, our physical families, are one of the greatest blessings that God has uh, for us. But family, uh, we recognize, can also be a burden. Uh, it can also be a hardship when relationships are uh, strained, uh, when there's uh, broken promises, 
uh, even in the context of a physical family, there's sometimes abuse. Uh, there's certainly neglect. And honestly, the family of God is no different. Uh, it's one of our greatest joys when it's working well. It's one of our greatest sources of support, one of our greatest sources of comfort and strength, but it can also be uh, one of the sources of our greatest uh, hurt. Um, being part of the family, uh, a physical family, is great for intimacy and love and, and the strength that we draw from one another. But when we are estranged from our family, that can be some of the deepest hurt that we know. Spiritually, that's true as well. And if we are involved uh, with the church and with the congregation and we're connected and we feel loved and supported and appreciated and we feel like we're able to love and support and appreciate uh, and edify others, that's great. But when that breaks down, um, that's really hard. That's really difficult. Uh, it can be then a mix of greatest blessings and greatest burdens uh, to be part of the family of God. And I think culturally, uh, again, as we become more independent, as we become more uh, transient in the sense that people move more often, that a lot of people live in places uh, where they didn't grow up, where they're not as connected uh, maybe organically to a church community as we might once would have been. Why then uh, should we seek a church connection? Why then should we seek that commitment? Uh, why does being connected to a church family matter so much uh, in our walk uh, with Christ? If we think about Jesus as our personal Lord and Savior, we think about our commitment to him and his commitment to us, why then do we need uh, a church family? Uh, why is it important that we be a part of a local connected uh, family of God? I want to share uh, a few ideas about that uh, this morning uh, in the time that we have. If you have your Bible, uh, go ahead and turn with me uh, to the book of Acts right after the Gospels. Uh, the book of Acts in the New Testament, the fifth book there of the New Testament, it tells the uh, story of the early church. Uh, it's the Acts of the Apostles, the Acts that the Spirit uh, was doing in and through um, the early church, especially the apostles. Uh, they're the ones who are highlighted. But it tells us a lot about um, some of the things that connected uh, the early church and why that connection and that commitment uh, was so important. Uh, to them. They lived in a very different world, at least externally, than many of us live in today. Uh, and yet this connection to the church and this commitment to the body of Christ that was so meaningful for them, uh, I think needs to be uh, meaningful for us as well. If we're there in Acts chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 2, um, this is following after uh, the we mentioned um, the commitment that we make to Christ through repentance and confession and baptism uh, last week. And so we want to pick up in Acts 2 and verse 40. Again, this is talking about Peter, who's been doing, doing the preaching there. It says, With many other words he, that's Peter, testified and exhorted them, be saved from this perverse or this crooked uh, generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they sold their possessions and divided them among all, as anyone had need. So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being uh, saved. The Lord added to the church daily uh, those who were being saved. First thing I would suggest that we can, we can see in the early church um, that I think is sometimes missing in our uh, thought or in our understanding today is that our commitment to Christ, um, as we read up in uh, earlier in chapter 2, uh, that decision to repent, to be baptized, uh, to receive the blessing of the Holy Spirit, to receive the remission of sins. Our commitment to Christ commits us to his church. Our commitment to Christ commits us to uh, his church. Um, being in Christ um, is the key to being in the church. Uh, sometimes I'll hear people say, and, and I know what they mean, and, and you do too. We probably have even said this ourselves. I just need to get back in church. 
Um, I just need to be in church. I know our family needs to be in church. It would be good for us to be in church. And of course, usually what the person means is they want to be active in a local congregation. Uh, maybe they've been away from the church as far as uh, gathering in person and worshiping or, or having that intimacy with the church. And so they'll say, we need to get back in church. But in reality, um, being in church, in the building, or in even in the assembly, uh, does not mean that we are in Christ. Um, I could go uh, downstairs, I'm here at the house filming this, go downstairs and stand in our garage, and I could stand there uh, all day. It would be very, very cold, but I could stand there all day, and I would not be a car. Um, you can say being uh, a, a car goes in a garage, and we, we currently have both of our vehicles are sitting in our garage right now. Um, it's good to be in a garage, but being in a garage doesn't make you a car. We put a car in a garage, uh, but a car is not the only thing that can be in a garage. Sometimes we think about church that way. I want to be in church, and we mean in the assembly or in worship. But in reality, if we are in Christ, we are a part of the church. Uh, being in the church is what uh, is the connection uh, that we share in Christ. And so uh, when they were baptized into Christ, it says that the Lord added them to the church. Um, there wasn't a situation where they became followers of Jesus, they became Christians, they became disciples, and then there was a long separated process of being uh, connected to the church. It was a simultaneous process that a person who was in Christ uh, through repentance and confession and baptism that we talked about last week through making that commitment, they become a part of uh, the church in an overall uh, general sense. Of course, there is uh, a sense in which um, being in Christ and in the church needs to be accompanied by a connection to uh, a local church family. The church at Jerusalem began uh, that day uh, in the sense that uh, that group was called out. Uh, they were um, brought into the family of God through their uh, receiving of Christ, through their obedient faith, uh, through God's grace. Uh, and then they were uh, added to, again, all at once, uh, the church uh, the church that belongs to, to Christ. Um, I think sometimes if we're not careful, again, our culture of individualism, our culture of, uh, you know, pulling ourselves up by our own bootstraps, our culture of, I can do it myself, um, that causes us to think that we get ourselves into Christ uh, and then we get ourselves into church. And in reality, the receiving of salvation in and through the blood of Jesus, coming in contact with that, uh, the grace of God through that faith that we display, uh, that not only puts us into Christ, it puts us into uh, the family of God. Um, there is not a direct connection, at least there is not an inherent direct connection between the place that we gather, the building that we gather in, the sign on the building out front, and what happens internally as far as our being added to uh, the church and added to the body uh, of Christ. Um, we could gather today, and Lord willing, we will, uh, at the building, and it's a church building. It's a place that we've designated uh, for the church to meet. It has a sign that says Lebanon Church of Christ uh, out front, and yet we could gather in that space uh, and do any number of things that are not directly a part of being uh, the family of God. Conversely, uh, there will be churches uh, all over the world today who gather in storefronts, they gather outdoors, uh, they will gather in school buildings, they will gather in rented spaces, and the church is gathered, and that group of committed believers uh, is committed to Christ and therefore a part of his church, even though they are not meeting in a place that we could point to and say, that's a church, or that's a church of Christ. That's a building where the church that belongs to Christ uh, meets. Ultimately, it's not the sign out front um, that defines whether or not a church is committed to Christ and therefore the people that gather there are committed not just to Christ but to his church. Uh, it is the condition of uh, the heart, it is the condition of the people, and whether or not the Lord uh, has added them to his uh, spiritual family. In John chapter 13, when Jesus is talking to his disciples as they are 
um, preparing uh, the Last Supper and they're there eating together and he's looking to the cross in just a few hours. Uh, he tells them, uh, a new commandment I give you, that you should love one another as I have loved you. By this, all men will know you are my disciples and that you have loved uh, one another. Uh, John 13, uh, 34 and 35. Um, it's not a question of, can I love Christ and then love his church? Or can I love his church and then love Christ? They are uh, connected. And when we make a commitment to Christ, it must be accompanied by a commitment to his church. He adds us to his church. Uh, God adds us to the saved body of believers when we make our commitment to Christ. And then we must follow that commitment to Christ by connection and commitment uh, with a local gathered body of God's people. Uh, our commitment to Christ, and we read there in Acts 2 what all the early church was doing just there in Jerusalem. And even though that's only uh, five, six, seven verses there, it talks about all the things that they did as a connected and committed community of believers. They were involved in worship. They were involved in fellowship. They were involved in mission and carrying the gospel uh, to others. They were involved in witness and setting an example uh, to the community around them. They were involved in devotional uh, practices together from house to house. They were edifying one another and building one another up. They were financially uh, connected to one another and doing benevolent work, making sure that no one went without. It wasn't like on the day of Pentecost, 3,000 souls were baptized. They were added to the church in a uh, ethereal sense, in a spiritual sense by, by God. And then they all went back to their individual lives as if nothing uh, had changed. We have to recognize that a commitment to Christ, uh, the commitment that is demonstrated uh, through repentance, through confession, through baptism, through faithful living, is never done alone. It's never done in a silo. Uh, it's never something where we, where we bring that uh, presence of Christ into our lives and then we return immediately uh, to life as we knew it before. A connection to Christ, when it is uh, done in a way that most mirrors Scripture, uh, always connects us to other believers. It always connects us and commits us to a community of faith. I think sometimes um, we see large uh, evangelistic uh, efforts that take place, and we may see people that are uh, baptized into Christ, but there is a breakdown in their uh, commitment to Christ and their belief in him as Savior, and then him having lordship over their lives that connects them to a local body of believers. We want to be very careful uh, that we understand that, that people's situations are, are different, um, that people's circumstances are different, that the ease of gathering is different. That's one of the reasons we offer this online. Um, but just being in person, just being in a church building is not uh, the only action uh, that makes us a part of the family of God. And so the things that we've mentioned here, uh, benevolence, edification, worship, missions, uh, financial um, uh, ties, all of those things are an important part of our commitment to Christ, but also tied directly into uh, our commitment to his church. Now, all that sounds great when you read it from Acts. Sounds like everything in Jerusalem was awesome, uh, that everyone was, was just getting along great, uh, there were signs and wonders being done. The Holy Spirit was active uh, in their community. They were engaged with one another. But of course, as we continue through the book of Acts, we see very quickly that there were uh, people whose hearts were not right, even though they were in the assembly. Uh, there were people who were discouraged because they felt like they were being uh, overlooked and neglected in some of these very actions uh, that Luke tells us the early church was involved in. And so this brings me to um, my second thought, and I think something that we need to admit, is that although the church, uh, the church that belongs to Christ, uh, the ideal, the church that we have in our, our mind, it is perfect in plan in the scriptures. It's perfect. Uh, it's bought by Christ. It's given to us by Christ. It is the bride of Christ. It's perfect in plan, but yet it often struggles in practice. It's perfect in plan, uh, it's laid out perfectly for us, but because we're involved in it, because people are involved in it, we often struggle in the practice of, of being the church well. Um, 
if my commitment to Christ commits me to the church, I'm going to be very discouraged as soon as uh, the church starts being unchristlike. And I think we need to just say that. Uh, that's an elephant in the room for a lot of people. They don't want to criticize uh, the church or they don't want to think that the church could be uh, imperfect uh, in a lot of ways. Um, the church is perfectly planned. It's given to us and, and the word is given to us uh, perfectly for how to uh, govern the church and Christ as head of the church. But in the execution, in the practice of being the church, uh, we often struggle uh, because we are people. The church has a people problem. Um, no matter uh, how great a group of Christians we can gather, no matter how committed we are, no matter how faithful we are, there's always going to be ways in which we could improve and ways in which, honestly, uh, we fall short. Things that we uh, don't do well as a body of believers. Things that we know to do but don't do well are things that we know to do and yet sometimes leave uh, undone. And so to admit that, to say up front that the church uh, is an important part of my life, that the church is uh, an important part, an essential part of the plan that Christ has for his people, that does not negate the fact that the church has to be worked out in us and through us uh, in daily life and in a community. I love um, the Corinthian correspondence, and one of the things I love, particularly about 1 Corinthians, is Paul is talking to, he's engaging with people who are already believers uh, in the church at Corinth. And he talks about, uh, very openly, the idea that they're becoming Christians uh, and them gathering as a church and being a faithful church uh, family and, and making the effort that they were making uh, to gather and to worship that did not eliminate uh, their humanness uh, or their uh, tendency to sin uh, or the fact that there were uh, challenges and issues in that church. And as you go through 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about how uh, there's a tension uh, between uh, how Jews and Gentiles receive the gospel. There's a tension over people's preferred uh, preachers uh, in the church. Some people were bigger fans of Paul. Others preferred Apollos' teaching. Uh, some were saying, well, let's just be like Christ. And some were even bringing Peter's name uh, into that mix. Paul talks about the idea that there was sexual immorality uh, taking place within the church. He talks about the idea that there were lawsuits and um, dissensions over property uh, within the church. He talked about the fact that some notorious sins uh, that they had been involved in in their past life, that they had put behind them, uh, they were now judging others for those same type of things. He talks about abuses of the Lord's Supper. He talks about people who were struggling in their uh, marriages and struggling to understand uh, singleness. He talks about uh, the idea that they were um, more concerned with their spiritual gifting than they were with love for one another. All these things are mentioned in the context of writing to a church. Uh, people who were gathered together, already believers, not uh, people out in the world in the streets of Corinth, but people gathered in the assembly uh, as a local church. Paul doesn't say, well, now that we're Christians, none of those things matter. He doesn't naively say, now that we're believers, we no longer have any struggles with those things. He instead gives them uh, concrete things that they can do, concrete ways to respond uh, to certain behaviors, and then draws them what toward the idea that love is the great unifier uh, in their assembly, and love is the great unifier uh, in the body of Christ. I think sometimes we hold ourselves to a standard, or we hold the church to a standard, uh, that sets us up for failure. Um, sometimes you'll hear people say, I would be uh, you know, an active part of a church, I would be a part of a church family, uh, but the church is full of hypocrites. You know, The church is full of people who say one thing and do another. And that certainly can be the case. Uh, we can all be guilty of hypocrisy uh, at different times in our walk with Christ. But I would suggest in that conversation, and, and when we're having that conversation, that if a person expects a church to be uh, perfect uh, in its practice, uh, they are setting themselves up uh, for disappointment. Um, any church that was perfect would be imperfect the minute that we became a part of it. Um, that is not to say that we cover up uh, abuses, uh, that the church is to be a place where 
we just say, well, people can live however they want to, or uh, where we have a critical spirit and drive people away without first um, extending to them the love of God and the presence of Christ and seeking forgiveness and restoration and reconciliation, as we talked about before. But I do think um, for us to sit back, uh, as many do in our culture, and say, well, the church is full of, of bad things, the church is full of, of people who are doing bad things, uh, and then to use that as a reason not to uh, reach out to the church or not to be a part of the church, to think that we can withdraw into ourselves uh, and ignore uh, the presence of the church and the need for the church in our lives simply because uh, the people are imperfect and the practice of the church is imperfect. Uh, we've ultimately set ourselves up um, to constantly be disappointed. Uh, and I think that engenders a lot of bitterness um, sometimes when people are critical of the church, they're critical of the church of 30 years ago, or they're critical of a congregation that they experienced 50 years ago in childhood, but they have not um, made the effort or the attempt to be engaged with the local church uh, today. Uh, we want to be very careful uh, that we reach out to people in a way that acknowledges uh, that we can be deeply hurt by the church. As we said, it's the family of God. And family squabbles, family hurts, uh, family um, estrangement hurts the worst because we want to feel accepted. We want to feel, and we believe that we should feel, uh, rightfully so, included and accepted and, and, and uh, welcomed. But I think we want to also, even as we extend uh, grace and compassion and care to people who've been hurt by the church, recognize that uh, to have a spirit that says, I don't need the church because the church has let me down, uh, is short-sighted. And I don't think that we would have that view uh, of other relationships in our lives. Um, it's important, I think, to understand that we're all at a different point along our spiritual journey. But at no point do we fail to need the presence of other believers. At no point uh, should we withdraw and say, I can do better on my own. I can do this without anybody else. Uh, when we do that, uh, we're standing in our own strength, uh, not in the strength that Christ supplies and not in the strength uh, that the church can offer as God's people. One verse that we often take out of context uh, in, in some ways when talking about the assembly uh, and the importance of being in the assembly is uh, found in Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 23, Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 23. Uh, our confession, our hope. Uh, and let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and in so much more as you see the day uh, approaching. As difficult things are happening in our lives, as, uh, as hardships are happening in our lives, it is a tool of um, our adversary. It's a tool of Satan to say, uh, you don't need uh, to be gathered with other believers. Uh, you don't need to uh, entrust your um, heart or entrust your weakness to other people. You need to stand alone uh, and stand back from them uh, so that they won't judge you. Um, scripture tells us, and Jesus demonstrates for us, the idea that in those moments, we need the church more than ever. Um, that's not to say that every situation is healthy. That's not to say that we don't need discernment uh, in who we choose to gather with. That's not to say that everyone who wears the name of Christian or every place that, uh, every group that gathers as a church uh, is a faithful church uh, that would be a support to us. But we do need to understand uh, that to try to go it alone, uh, to try to live the Christian life without a connection to a church family is, one, um, not the example that we see in Scripture, but two, personally very dangerous for us. Um, when I am not responsible for anybody else and for encouraging anybody else or building up anybody else, when I am not responsible to uh, anyone else uh, for looking to them and, and taking in their um, advice and their encouragement into my life, uh, I'm in a very dangerous place uh, spiritually. The last thing I'll mention, 
And I think this, this plays into uh, the two other ideas that we've shared. Um, in thinking about those ideas, our commitment to Christ commits us to the church. Uh, the church is perfect in plan, but imperfect in practice. Um, it struggles in practice, and yet we still need that connection. The last thing I would say is that the church and Christ are a package deal. Um, they're a package deal. They come uh, tied together uh, for the faithful for the faithful believer. I've used this type of analogy before, but I, it, it strikes me in a way that's powerful. Um, if we were getting ready for an event and someone called Anne-Marie and they said, Hey, Anne-Marie, we're having a big party and everyone we know is coming. We definitely want uh, you to come, but we aren't really interested in Will being there. Um, you know, he's kind of weird. <laughs> uh, he kind of kills the vibe. We know you love him, uh, and, and he's probably, he's probably great, uh, part of the time, but we really just want, uh, you to be there. He gets in our way. He, 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 he gets on our nerves. Um, we know you understand, you know, it's nothing personal against you, but we just really don't want him, uh, around. Be sure to remind him that we want you to come. Uh, we want you to be a part of what we're doing, uh, but we really don't want him here when we're doing our thing. Now, if someone called Anne Marie or sent Anne Marie a text and said that, and said everyone's getting together, it's going to be a great time, uh, we really want you to come, but be sure that Will knows he's not welcome. I hope that Anne Marie would say, "Well, I'm not. I'm not coming either." Um, this person that I love, that I care about. Uh, that I've committed my life to, if they're not welcome um, in your presence, if they're not welcome in your home, if they're not welcome in your life, then I don't feel welcome either. That sounds absurd, right? That, that, that we would think that someone would be that callous or that unkind or that cruel. And yet many people from week to week say that about Jesus. I love Jesus, but I don't like the church. Uh, I need Jesus. Jesus is my personal Lord and Savior, but it's his people that get on my nerves. I can, I can worship God outdoors. I can worship God without the church. Uh, my heart, God knows my heart. My worship is genuine. I don't need the church uh, getting in my way. Now you say, well, that's not the same. Uh, Jesus is Jesus. The church is the church. It's not like a husband and a wife. I want to invite you, the last passage we'll look at is in Ephesians Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This is an analogy that is used multiple times in Scripture, both for God to talk about Israel and uh, in the relationship of Christ and the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, um, it's talking about the importance of, of gathering and singing together and worshiping together. And then um, it says in verse 21, that we are to be submitting to one another in the fear of God. Then in verse 22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as also Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body, the head and the body, the bride and the groom. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let wives be subject to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies, for he who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes it and cherishes it, just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let her let the wife see that she respects her husband. Just by the repetition of the words, we can see the intimacy that's intended between Christ and the church, that they are like a husband and a wife. They are like a head and a body. They are like uh, two things, two entities that are so connected that one without the other is not itself. Um, if we think that, 
If we say that we believe that, we love that passage, right? To say wives ought to submit to their husbands. Um, that's, that's a part of the context. But what Paul says at the end, I think is vital. Um, the mystery is not just physical husbands and physical wives and, and their life together. The reason that their life together is so uh, intimate and so important and there needs to be this relationship of respect and submission and love is because it is a uh, a mirror of who Christ is for and to uh, his church. We are a bonded pair. Husbands and wives, we understand, are bonded. If, if, a, if a marriage ends uh, in death, there is hurt. If a marriage ends in divorce, there is deep emotional pain. There is a tearing away of people that are bonded together. Uh, even when there has been um, uh, challenges in a relationship, uh, to separate, to, to break those people up uh, is, a, is a terrible thing. And we understand the, the, the hurt of that and how deep that goes. If that's true of our physical relationships between husbands and wives, and Christ uh, is the husband of the church, and the church is his bride, why would we think it would be any different for believers to pull away and try to separate from the headship and the lordship uh, of Christ? The church without Christ is a social club. Um, we may do a lot of good work. Uh, we may be nice people. We may be moral people, but we lack the power that comes from our experience of Christ. And Christ, when he is deprived of his church, uh, he does not have the means that he has appointed to do his work in the world. It's not just that we um, lose out on our personal salvation, as important as that is. When we forsake the church, when we say we don't need the church, we insult Christ who died for the church, and we cripple the local body of believers. Paul would write in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that when we fail to use our gift, when we fail to use our, our uh, talents as members of the body, we are pulling things away from the body that it needs. When we envy others and, and want their gifts and refuse to use our own, we are, we are damaging and hurting uh, the very body of Christ and the body's effectiveness uh, in our community. When we reject the church, we reject the bride of Christ. And in rejecting the bride of Christ, we reject Christ. I think it's key that, that when I say this, I'm not saying this um, just as a preacher uh, or just as a person who, uh, who, who you know, is um, someone who, who loves the church and, and works for the church and, and tries to minister uh, as a part of the church. I want this to be the message of Scripture to us that we don't need to think that our commitment to Christ and our commitment to the church can be separated into two completely different camps. If we are truly committed to Christ, we need to be committed uh, to the church. If we are committed to the church and gathering with the church and being a part of the church, that is going to deepen and strengthen our commitment to Christ. The church belongs to Christ. Uh, it is Christ's church. And anything under the lordship of Jesus is precious to him, and it ought to be precious to us. When we badmouth the church, when we say we don't need the church, when we say we'll take Jesus but leave the church, we hurt the heart of God. There are times, and we've all maybe experienced these times, when a local gathered church needed change, needed correction, was going in the wrong direction, needed um, a better boundaries or uh, needed to go back to the Word of God and see how leaders ought to lead or to see how worship ought to be done. There's a difference in reforming the church and rejecting the church. There's a difference in seeking to restore and rebuild and to edify the church and to say, we don't need the church. We've got Jesus. We don't need the church. Those are two different attitudes and two different mindsets, and we need to be able to see that and appreciate that. The path to a better church, a better local congregation, is not tearing it down. It's not. It's building it up. Um, it, we need more commitment to the church, more love, more grace, more knowledge, more strength, more edification, more devotion, more benevolence, more mission, more preaching, more teaching, more worship. We need more of that 
in the church. When we have more of those things and we're more deeply committed to those things, we become more like Christ and Christ is not ashamed uh, to call us uh, his church. The answer is not to, to tear it all down. The answer is to see what good remains, to strengthen it, to edify it, to build it up. And in doing that, we demonstrate our commitment, yes, to our church family, but also our commitment to Christ and his bride, the bride for which he died, the bride that we want to be a part of in order to be pleasing to him. I think it's important in our culture and in the world in which we live that we understand a commitment to Christ is a commitment to his church, that a commitment to the church helps us strengthen our commitment to Christ. Uh, that's what scripture teaches, and I think we see that played out again and again and again uh, through history. When Christians are stronger, the church is stronger. When the church is stronger uh, and encouraging um, individual believers to be stronger, the cause of Christ is blessed. And I think we can take hope uh, and encouragement in that. Again, so glad that you're able to um, be here with us today. Uh, I'm, I'm really enjoying this series on commitment. Uh, I think it's important that we consider these things and consider our own commitment. And maybe you have never become uh, a follower of Jesus, uh, never made that initial commitment that we talked about last week of repenting of sin, of confessing Christ, of being baptized. We would love to help you with that. Uh, reach out to us if that is your need. But as many of you may already be Christians, um, followers of Jesus, disciples. Um, we need to double down, I think, on our commitment, not just to the church as a concept, but to the church in practice. It doesn't get better uh, if, we, if the best and brightest people pull away. Um, we have to be willing uh, to discern what situations are good, what situations are healthy, and how we can use the gifts and talents that we have uh, to build up and encourage the church. If you've pulled away from the local church, not just the Lebanon church, but wherever you may be, um, I would encourage you to uh, find um, a body of Christ to plug into, to be involved in. Uh, we were never intended to be disciples alone. Uh, disciples have to have a teacher, and they have to have one another uh, to reach their full potential, and I would encourage you to do that today. Let's go ahead and uh, be taking out our uh, communion supplies, if you have those uh, with you, I mentioned 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 11 gives us a great insight into how the uh, church at Corinth was uh, needing uh, to reform uh, some of the ways that they were observing the Lord's Supper. But Paul also tells them about how he knows about this observance, that the Lord uh, told him this, uh, that it, it came to him uh, in his time with the Lord. Um, um, he was reminded of, of what the Lord's purpose was. The bread would remind us of Christ's body, and we take it uh, together to do that each week. The cup would remind us of his blood, the blood of the covenant uh, that was given for the remission of sins. And we take it as well to be reminded of that. Obviously, the, the ideal situation, we take this together, uh, gathered. But I do want to offer a couple of prayers for those of you who may be um, isolated today or maybe with your family, maybe the only uh, believer present. Uh, and I uh, want to offer these prayers in case you uh, need those and they would be helpful in helping you reflect on the Lord today. We'll pray first for the bread, uh, and then we'll pray for the cup together. Let's pray. Our Lord and Father in heaven, we're so thankful for your willingness to send Christ into this earth to carry our sins upon the cross. And as we take this bread, we remember that he was made flesh and dwelt among us. We remember his body that he gave on our behalf. Help us to do this in a way that reminds us of his sacrifice and proclaims his death until he comes. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And let's pray also for the cut at this time. Let's pray together. Our Father, we're likewise thankful for the cup and for the fact that for us as believers, it calls to mind the fruit of the vine, the blood of Christ that was shed upon the cross for the sins of the world. Help us to consider our lives today and to do this in a way that causes us to look back upon the cross, but also look forward to Christ's coming. Help us to remember him and to honor him until he comes. It's in his name we pray. Amen.
Amen. Well, again, thank you for being here today and for sharing this time with us uh, as we've continued this uh, series on commitment. Uh, I hope today has been an encouragement to you. Uh, next week, Lord willing, we want to talk about commitment uh, to sharing the gospel and uh, the fact that one of the church's uh, highest goals and highest aims is to carry uh, the message of Christ and the commitment that we have uh, to Christ and with Christ uh, into all the world. And we look forward to sharing that, uh, Lord willing, next time. As far as announcements for our local folks at Lebanon Go, uh, if you have your offering and want to give that, I know we've had folks that have uh, sent that in or needed that picked up if they've not been able to be with us uh, in some time. You can just um, message us, uh, text me, or call, and uh, we'll make sure that you have an opportunity to do that uh, today. I do want to mention some birthdays uh, that we have coming up this week. On Wednesday the 24th, uh, be Brittany Cole's birthday, and we're so thankful for Brittany and uh, the, the fact that she's been worshiping with us for several months and uh, for her work at UTM and uh, grateful for her and hope she has a, a blessed year and a blessed semester uh, ahead. Uh, it's also Friday the 26th is Sandy Hogan's birthday. Uh, many of you know Ricky and Sandy Hogan who've been worshiping with us. They were both baptized uh, into Christ last Sunday and I uh, made a post about that and, and sharing in that celebration uh, with them and for them and grateful for them and that commitment uh, that they've made. Uh, Friday is also uh, Tammy Doyle's birthday and we're thankful for Tammy and want to remember her as she's uh, continuing her cancer treatments and grateful that she's been able to be with us in person uh, in the last uh, last couple of weeks. Also, Betsy Robinson's birthday. I have the date wrong, maybe, but I believe that's Saturday. I could be wrong about that. I'll double check. Uh, I may have uh, written the date down wrong, but Betsy's birthday is this week, and I'm uh, thankful for her and for all she does uh, in our community. As I mentioned, as far as updates go, we want to rejoice with Ricky and Sandy uh, Hogan and their baptism last Sunday. Uh, grateful for them and the part they've played uh, in our church family. Uh, reminder, as I mentioned at the outset, that all services will meet today, uh, Lord willing, at the building. So we'll be there uh, 9 uh, for our Sunday school classes, uh, 10 a.m. for worship, and 5 p.m. for our uh, discussion Bible study. Uh, we do have an updated directory. Uh, if you need a copy of that, just let me know. Uh, we'll be sure to get you that. Uh, be thinking about our, um, we have a business meeting coming up. We may have uh, some new uh, needs that we're aware of in the community, some works that we want to participate in. Uh, if you're aware of something like that, uh, be ready to uh, share that with us, and we'll get the date on that firmed up today in person and be able to share that uh, for our, our plans for our meeting. I want to continue to remember our missionaries uh, this week. I've been in contact with a couple of them. Uh, also in March, uh, I believe it's the 24th, uh, Chris Carter will be with us. Uh, and we'll be sharing uh, an update and a report on uh, the jail ministry, prison ministry uh, that he and Sandra are involved in in Florida. And we're excited about that, thankful that for that work uh, that the Carters are doing. Uh, also, um, some of you know or may have seen, um, also in March, there'll be a, a gospel meeting over at Greenfield, and I'll be the speaker uh, for that. And we'll make you aware of the dates and, and times on that as we get uh, closer to time. Uh, we do have information about the yearly uh, Honduras mission trip and signing up for that. Uh, that mission trip, of course, is uh, coordinated out of the McKenzie congregation with several other uh, smaller churches uh, assisting in that and sharing in that. If you have a question about that or an interest in that, uh, we have that information at the building, or you can contact us and we can email it on to you. Uh, we do still have some copies of Power for Today, uh, devotional left. If you uh, maybe have lost yours <laughs> during the snow or uh, didn't pick one up beforehand. Uh, we have some of those and we can get you one if you need it. Um, as far as health concerns and trials, people dealing with issues, um, please continue to pray for Lee Gwynn. Uh, Lee is still in uh, St. Francis Hospital in Memphis, uh, but Lord willing, he will be making the move back to uh, Weekly County Nursing Home this week. Lee's had a very difficult time uh, the last several weeks, and obviously we want to remember Judith and their whole family in that and continue to remember and pray for Lee. I want to continue, as I said, to remember Tammy uh, as she's going for treatments. Uh, Ms. Dolores Dunlap's surgery was postponed uh, due to the snow this past week. That will be coming up uh, in a couple of weeks in February, and we'll make you aware of updates uh, on Dolores' condition. She's having a really uh, difficult time and hoping uh, that there'll be a cancellation where she can get that surgery 
uh, done. Uh, otherwise, it'll be a couple of weeks before uh, they're able to get that rescheduled. I want to remember uh, Jimmy Mayo, Jennifer Mayo, uh, Myra Deaver, as well as Mitchell and Charlie Culver, both of them. I uh, continue to remember Robert Boyd um, and um, Barbara Parker. Those are Andrea's dad and stepmother uh, who've been having health challenges. We also remember Roberta, uh, who is Andrea's mother, who is in the ass assisted living uh, in Bales and is not doing well at this time. Continue to remember Kim Chadwell, uh, Mike Donahoe, Gertie Sheffield, uh, Vicki Whitworth, who is Betsy Robinson's friend, who's uh, dealing with breast cancer. Also, Miss Sarah, who is Betsy's friend, who is um, has been at Cane Creek and will be moving to Greenbrier. We'll continue to remember her. Remember Miss Faye Robinson, uh, who is having a hard time at home and been struggling with some falls. I uh, want to continue to remember her. Um, we want to remember the family and friends of John Brotherton. Uh, John has been on our prayer list. He's the friend of Blake Stoker, who owns the um, one of the barbecue uh, places in Texas that uh, Blake did some of his uh, training and visiting, and they are very good friends. Uh, John passed away uh, after a, a sudden um, incident a couple of weeks ago and uh, has been in the hospital, and, and he did pass away uh, this week. We want to remember Blake and Stacy. Uh, as they will be traveling to be at his funeral. And um, just want to continue to remember uh, him. You may have seen some of the many posts online uh, where uh, he just was a very uh, kind person and looked out for a lot of uh, people in that industry and want to continue to remember him. Obviously want to remember folks who are still dealing with the bad uh, weather, uh, folks up north who are still uh, completely snowed in and people who are getting out uh, for the first time and need to be careful uh, in our area. There's large numbers of sickness in our community. As people have been home this week, maybe we've gotten a little break uh, from some of that, but school will be starting back uh, tomorrow and uh, certainly want to remember everyone uh, who's dealing with that. Uh, there's probably something that I've overlooked or left out, uh, but again, uh, just let us know and we'll try to get that announced uh, today. Um, I want to mention uh, that, again, we will be meeting, uh, Lord willing, 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and 5 p.m., back to our regular uh, scheduled service times today. And I think it's great uh, that we've uh, been able to think about commitment. And I would suggest that, that maybe if you're on the fence about that, or maybe you have a question that's been raised by today's uh, lesson or some thoughts or some comments that you want to share, uh, reach out with those. Um, this is not uh, just a dialogue. That's one of the great things about being together in person. We can bat those ideas back and forth, and, and uh, I think that's helpful for us. Uh, with that being said, we'll go ahead and close here online uh, with a word of prayer, and we'll go out uh, and face our week uh, together. Uh, God is committed uh, to us in Christ, and if we're committed to Christ, we have to be committed uh, to his church. Uh, he adds us to his church. We're a part of his church. But that commitment and that consistency, uh, it's up to us to continue that and to, uh, to draw the greatest benefit from it and to be the greatest benefit in the life of others through that constant uh, commitment. Let's pray together. Our Lord and Father in heaven, again, we're grateful for this day, grateful for the week that we've had, and grateful for the week that lies ahead. Lord, be with us and help us to show uh, our commitment, not just to you and not just to the people we love, but uh, to your body, to the church. Uh, help us to live out that commitment day by day. Help us to be uh, generous as we uh, seek to build up the church. Help us to encourage one another and to look out for one another as we have the opportunity Go with us and bless us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hope everybody has a great week. And Lord willing, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.